Let's open with prayer, guys. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this time together, and thank you, Lord, as we study this theme of you as our anchor of our soul. Please help us to really understand what a what a strong anchor you are and how you're the one that will hold fast in the storm. We can't, Lord, but you can. And I ask you, Father, to be with us this morning and give us a blessing. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, so as you can see, today's study is Jesus' anchor of the soul. Does somebody want to start off um, reading the memory verse for us, Hebrews 6, 19 and 20? Just raise your hand, and Raj has the mic. He'll be happy to come to you. Gilda has gone, said she would. Raj, you want, can, can we turn the mic on over here? Make sure the mic is on. Go ahead. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast, and one which enters within the veil, where Jesus has entered as a forerunner for us, having become a high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Amen. So I just want to cover this morning the, the, the structure, just briefly, the structure of the book of Hebrews, because it has a very intricate, chiastic structure. But for the purposes of morning, this morning's study, we're not going to be going over the intricacies. Just I put it in very simple terms for you guys so you can see a pattern that's emerging here. So in chapter 1, it identifies Jesus as the Son of God that God promised to send into the world. In chapter 2, he then gives a warning to take heed to the things that we've been told and shown. Chapter 3 then identifies Jesus as greater than Moses and gives a warning in verse 12 of the perils of unbelief and the hardening of our hearts. Chapter 4 identifies Jesus as our rest, but gives a warning to not fall short of entering into that rest. Chapter 5 identifies Jesus as our high priest and then warns us to not go back to elementary principles. Chapter 6, the one we're going to be dealing with today, the one that we're going to be studying today, is strictly a warning of the perils of falling away. Now, that's interesting because if you guys understand how chiastic structures work, they start off with an important topic and they end with a mirror of that important topic. And everything in between mirrors everything coming to the center. And it's interesting that in the very center of this, it's a warning. Hmm. Okay, chapters 7 through 10 go on to prove how Jesus is our high priest as the true sacrifice and our example. And, but in chapter 10, ends with a warning to not forsake the gathering of ourselves together and to warn us of the judgment because Jesus is also our judge. And then chapter 11 shows us that we are saved by our faith and gives us examples of how we can, how others have overcome. And that's interesting because there's no description of, of Jesus as, as anything here. And, and there's no warnings. It's just examples of faith. And then as a chiastic structure would work, in chapter 12, it identifies Jesus as the author and perfecter of that faith. So it tells us how everybody has overcome. But oh, guess what? They didn't do it on their own. It's because Jesus is the author and perfecter of their faith. And it warns us to lay aside all our sin and to love discipline. How many here love discipline? I don't necessarily love discipline. And to show gratitude. And then chapter 3 ends with telling us not to be afraid. Um, because Jesus is our helper. So two things to note from this. The author is intent on defining who Jesus is in all his capacities. Why? Well, because the Jews, remember, denied Jesus, right? They said he wasn't who he said he was. And so this was affirming that Jesus was everything they were looking for. Remember, the Jews revered Abraham. And Hebrews says, no, no, Jesus is greater than Abraham. They revered Moses, but no, no, Jesus is greater than Moses. They revered the angels, 
Um, but they said, no, Jesus is even greater than the angels. So this whole book was centered around proving that Jesus really was who he said he was, and he's even greater. And the second thing you see is what? What is the second emphasis that it's trying to make here? You can just shout it out. We don't need a mic for it. What's, it's just a simple word. What's the second emphasis that we see here? Let's see if I can... What are the second things that it's showing emphasis on? Warnings. Thank you. Warnings. Somebody was brave enough to shout it out. That was a very simple answer, but thank you, brother, for being brave enough to take the plunge. So why so many warnings? Anybody have any thoughts on that? Why so many warnings? To wake us up. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. So the warnings are, let's see if any of these apply to us today. Maybe they were just for the Jews back then. So take heed of the things that we've been told and shown. Do we need that for us today? We've been shown a lot of stuff. Are we still taking heed to them? We always need to check ourselves, don't we? Perils of unbelief and hardening of our hearts. You know, sometimes we can get complacent. And the more we drift off and do the things that we do that are kind of skirting the edges of that gray area, we become complacent in doing them. And the more gray that area gets until pretty soon we're in the dark area. It tells us to not fall short of entering into his rest. That's very important because the Sabbath is what sanctifies us, right? Uh, tells us to not go back to elementary principles. We should keep adding line upon line, precept upon precept. We shouldn't be just studying the basics over and over again. We're to be diggers into the word. And then not to fall away, not to forsake the gathering of ourselves together. Ooh, this is an important one, especially recently when we have a government telling us, no, no, you're not to gather. Do we obey God? Do we obey man? And then to lay aside all sin and then there again, love discipline, because guess what? That's what corrects us. That's what makes us go on to do the right things and to show gratitude. You know, the more I show gratitude, the happier I become. The more you look on the negative, by beholding, we become changed, right? Okay, so why so many warnings? We just covered that. I forgot to change slides. Sorry. So Ellen White tells us in Acts of the Apostles, uh, in the churches, open, unmasked error was supplanting the gospel message. And Christ, the true foundation of the faith, faith, was virtually renounced for the obsolete ceremonies of Judaism. You know, that can happen to us today. I'm not saying it has. I'm saying it can. You know, we get so used to the routines, so used to the, you know, going to the church and singing the songs and doing the rituals that are we really putting Jesus in the center of all of it? She says the apostles saw that if the believers were saved from the dangerous influences which threatened them, the most decisive measures must be given, the sharpest warnings given. So the more lethargic we become, the sharper the warnings need to be. Okay, so Sunday's lesson starts off tasting the goodness of the word. And so somebody wants to read Hebrews 6, 4, and 5 for us. Four through five, four and five. Just raise your hand. Thank you. For in the case of those who have once been enlightened, they have tasted of the heavenly gift and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come. Wonderful. So what three things were the believers in Christ given while they, as long as they were stayed faithful to him? What were the three things up here? They were enlightened, they were given a heavenly gift, and they were partakers of the Holy Spirit. Thank you. So let's go through them one by one. What's the benefit of being enlightened? Anybody have a Bible verse or something that comes to mind? What's the benefit of being enlightened? Oh, give, give them the mic. Give them the mic. I like that. That's good. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto the, 
my pathway. Yes, that's a good one. You know, I did not. That one didn't come to mind. See, that's why we have a group, because as we study together, the Holy Spirit gives us each different verses. So that's a really good, so it illuminates us, right? This is the one I thought of, Ephesians 1.18. He says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling. So being enlightened lets, gives us hope, right? And that the riches of his glory, of his inheritance in the saints. So it gives us all this blessing. So what's the heavenly gift? Anything come to mind? You guys are quiet this morning. Holy Spirit. Anybody else? That's a good one. Faith is a really good one. Faith is a really good one. Teaching. Teaching. These are all good gifts. Anybody else, Don? No, I think multiplication, the good word of God, tasting the good word of God and the powers of the age to come. So many people think they have committed the unpardonable sin because they've been so resistant. We're covering that later, so hold that thought. Oh, You're jumping like to good. way to Friday's lessons or but Thursday's lessons. So to, good to have actually experienced yes. eternal life, Amen. the quality of life, and having seen mm. the glory of God and his character and his goodness. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Okay, so you all thought of ones I didn't think of again. You all are like, that's why I love this. I thought of Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin of, is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. And then what does it mean to be a partaker of the Holy Spirit? So do you know, well, does anybody want to just give a brief what they think it means to be a partaker of the Holy Spirit? Go ahead. What it, it's your turn. It's this way. Um, what it means is that you experience the divine nature. Yes. Just as God was in Christ mm. reconciling the world. So to have to be a partaker of the Holy Spirit means that we, and this goes back up to the previous verse there, verses four and five, is, 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 to, is to, have the, to have a divine nature. Amen. Amen. And so, guess what? Do you know there's a Bible verse, that two Bible verses actually, that can tell us and explain that to us? So somebody want to read Isaiah 11, one through three? Uh, Go ahead, brother. The Holy Spirit was given as a helper. Yes. He was, said, I'll send you a helper. A helper. Amen. Amen. Did you want to read too or no? Were you just making the comment? You're welcome to read if you want to read. No? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. That was a very good answer. That was a very good answer. Somebody want to read this verse that's up on the screen? Thank you. Wait, 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 wait. It's going on record, so we're going to make you have the, even though you have a nice projection. Then a shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse. And a branch from his roots will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding. The spirit of counsel and strength. The spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. And he will not judge by what his eyes see. Nor make a decision by what his ears hear. Okay, so who is this shoot from the stem of Jesse? Jesus, that's exactly right. That's Jesus. And so it says that it says the Spirit of the Lord will rest on him. So did Jesus just get a little bit of the Holy Spirit or did he get the fullness of the Holy Spirit? He got the fullness, right? So, let, so he needed that for his mission on this earth. And because we are a partaker of the Holy Spirit, we need to discover these gifts uh, that Christ was given to the fullest so we can have them too. And by the way, these are things that you can pray for. I've been praying for these for the past 35 years, and God is more than willing to give you these gifts. So what's the first gift you see up there? Let's do them in order, not jump around. 
because I'm gonna, I, I put them in order. So, wisdom. You guys are good. Okay, wisdom. Wisdom is important because nowadays people's heads are full of information from all different sources. So people have having information doesn't make you wise. Being able to sort that information and put it in godly perspective and then utilize it. That's called wisdom. So we need wisdom. And we can pray for that. What's the second one? Understanding. Man, this one to me is, I can't say that one's more important than the other, but this is huge. You know, I pray all the time, Lord, insofar as possible, let me understand you. Of course, we can't understand God to the fullest, but insofar as possible, let me understand you. And your word, God, I want to understand your word. And then even on a more practical level, Lord, help me understand my husband. You know, so many disagreements come from a misunderstanding. You know, people saying, well, you said this. Well, no, that's not what I said exactly. I meant the, in our church family, give me understanding for my church family. I pray all the time, Lord, give me understanding for my Bible students so I can relate to them more. And that's what creates a bond is the understanding. Okay, what's number three? Counsel and strength. Spirit of counsel. Counsel is taking that wisdom and being able to put it together to teach and to give people wise advice. You know, the world is full of advice today. You know, if you're a boy, you can be a girl. If you're, you know, whatever, you can be whatever. You can say and you can do, and it's your truth, and your truth is your truth. But counsel is the wisdom put together with God's word to be able to give not your own advice, but the advice that the Bible or the Holy Spirit would have you give. That's a good gift. I pray for that all the time. What's number four? Strength. 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 So we learned a few months ago. I'm sure none of you remember. But, you know, when, when we pray, you know, to love the Lord your God with all your might and all your power, that was the word, the Hebrew word me'od, and it meant veriness or muchness. Um, but this word is not that. This word is a word called gabura. Sorry if I'm smattering the, uh, the uh, <coughs> Hebrew, um, which means forcefulness. So why would we need forcefulness? Well, if you're preaching the word, isn't it good to have the Holy Spirit back it up? Have you ever been talking to somebody and you just feel so inadequate and you're just like in your head praying, Lord, be with my words. Help me convey this. I need you. And all of a sudden, you're finding Bible verses and you're saying things that you could not know or do on your own or recall. That's that Holy Spirit power. We can pray for that. Okay, another one? Knowledge. 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 You know, today when we get everything in little snippets here and little snippets there and everything is fed to us in, in, in quick minutia, we all have ADD, don't we? And if you talk to most people and you say, when's the last time you read a book? They're like, oh, wow. Wow. It's been years, but it's a good thing to read, and that gives us knowledge. That's what gives us the knowledge to be able to know the Word of God. So we can pray for God to take away that ADD and to give us that knowledge that we need to know to be able to teach and give counsel and to have wisdom. Okay, um, is there another one? Fear of the Lord. So we talked about this before, and I'm going to just... Re touch on it just briefly in a few minutes more. Um, but this is not, you know, we talked about this. This is a healthy fear that leads us to obedience. Um, and so is there another trait up there or is this it? Mm, Jennifer kind of touched on it. So look, there's something up there. It doesn't really say that, does it? But it says, he will not judge by what his eyes see, nor make a decision by what his ears hear. So is, is that something? Is that something? So remember, the Bible says by two or three witnesses, a matter is proven. So let's go to another passage that does the exact same thing. Don? I was just thinking in terms of practical application of all of these points. Um, when the, the board meets and has an agenda and some of them are really important or if you're just counseling with someone or someone's in distress or facing real challenges 
at the best, we don't see near, we, we, we don't see everything. Our, mm. our eyesight, mm. our intelligence, our knowledge is so limited. Yes. Even when we're all together. But God, on the other hand, God, on the other hand, who is the source of all wisdom, understanding, mm -hmm. counsel, strength, he knows everything. Mm -hmm. And he says, let me guide you. Yes. Let me lead you. Yes. Let, let me show you. Mm -hmm. And sometimes he'll just show us the next step. And, and remember, Jesus says we have not because we ask, ask not. not. These, we can ask for these guys. I literally pray for these on a daily basis. I literally do. Okay, so going through Proverbs, notice real quick, uh, notice that Proverbs gives the same list of, so I, wisdom, there's number one, wisdom, dwell with prudence, and I find knowledge, there's knowledge from our list, and discretion, there's that discernment. Okay, so that's number seven that Jennifer noticed there so discernment and fear of the lord and here is fear of the lord number six but it it expounds on it more it's to hate evil and by the way guys this isn't mean hate evil in somebody else so easy to hate evil in somebody else so easy to look at somebody and go <laughs> you know look at wow they're doing that or this or you know i would never do that this is learning to hate evil in me lord make me hate the evil that's in me Help me identify it and help me hate it. Pride and arrogance and the evil way and the perverted mouth. Okay, and then number three, counsel. There's counsel is mine and sound wisdom. It repeats it again because who can have enough wisdom? And I, understanding, and power is mine. Where's the power? There's power. So notice that it gives it. So what is discernment? It's a gift from the Holy Spirit that allows us to understand a situation or know something that our eyes and ears would otherwise be telling us. For instance, it would have been very beneficial for the apostles if they had had discernment when Christ was on the cross, right? Because their eyes told them that he had lost their bat the battle. Their ears heard the angry shouts from virtually everyone, and they believed that all was lost. So discernment in that moment would have allowed them to look beyond what their senses were relating to them. So discernment is a super important gift to pray for, to look beyond what appears to be. And the reason they, the reason they didn't have it is because they wouldn't listen. Right. They weren't in prayer enough. Yeah. So Monday's lesson. I, you know, I'd like to know how I did that because I didn't do that on purpose, how it cool scrolls up there. I, I, that was an accident, guys, but... Kind of a cool accident. Anyway, I shouldn't have told you that. You would have all thought I'm like some sort of a computer genius. But anyway, impossible to restore. I like this next section because this is what you were alluding to, and we're going to get into this. Somebody want to read Hebrews 6, 4 through 6? For in the case of those who have once been enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away. It is impossible to renew them again to repentance since they again crucified to themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. So I remember, you know, when I came into the church when I was 13, and then um, I fell away when I was 17, because, of course, at 17, you know everything. Why do you need church or God? And I was away, and what I learned in the world was it terrified me, and I knew that God had given me the best thing that I'd ever had in my entire life. But I remember reading this verse, and it scared me to death, thinking that there's no hope for me. So why does this verse say that it is impossible to renew someone that has fallen away? So we're going to read some verses. So uh, first, in order to answer this, we need to examine what it means to come to Christ in the first place and to be crucified. So I need four volunteers. If you can raise your hands, they're just short little verses, as you can see. But Raj will be happy, just four people. Okay, there's Amber back there. There's a gentleman here. What's your name? Jason. Jason. So Amber, Jason, I need two more. Martin said he will. 
Did you want to? No? Some of you want to read? And then Verna. Okay. So, got that, Raj? Yes. I'm going to count on you to remember. <laughs> Matthew 16? Yes, please. Matthew 16, 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Okay, so what's involved in, in coming to Christ? Denying ourselves. Okay, Jason? Romans 6, 6. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him, in order that our body of sin might be done away with, so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. Amen. Okay, who was the next one? Was it Martin? So what's involved in that one? Crucifying self, right? And then Galatians 2.20? I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ in me. Mm, so we see a theme here. So, and then Verna? Galatians 5:24 Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So basically being crucified with to to Christ means you've died. So how can you be made alive again? It's impossible, right? So why does this verse then say it's impossible to renew someone that has fallen away? So going back um so I went to uh, a commentary, Barnes and no uh, Barnes Notes, excuse me, I almost said Barnes and Noble, Barnes Notes, um, that was a commentary during Ellen, one of the many during Ellen White's day. Um, most of them were on the same page. I liked his comment, so I concluded it here. He said, of sincere Christians, it might be said with the utmost propriety that they could not be renewed again and be saved if they should fall away because they rejected the only plan of salvation after they've tried it and renounced the only scheme of redemption after they'd tasted its benefits. If that plan could not save them, what could? If they neglected that, by what other means could they be brought to God? So then I asked myself, well, does impossible really then mean impossible? And you know me, I like a good word study, so I went to a word study, and uh, the word impossible means adonatan, and this word occurs only in the New Testament. And in all ten instances, they denote a thing that cannot be done. As in Hebrews 11.6 where it says, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. Okay, possible means impossible. Hebrews 10.4, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Never could. Hebrews 6.18, it is impossible for God to lie. So basically... Impossible means impossible. Then how can there be hope for any of us? And why am I standing here today? Here's the answer. Somebody want to read that in Luke? Oh, thank you, Jim. Oh, the whole verse? Mm -hmm. Luke 18, 24, 27. And Jesus looked at him and said, How hard is it for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God? For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. They who heard this said, then who can be saved? But he said, the things that are impossible with people are possible with God. Mm. Isn't that beautiful? Let that soak in a minute. So the things that are impossible with God are impossible. God says, if I tell you it's impossible with me, it's impossible because I can't lie. But things that are impossible for you are not impossible for me. So if it's impossible to renew you again to, to being a Christian, guess what? I can still do that. Jim? The other thing is things that are, have to be spiritually discerned. You mm -hmm. have to have the spirit. So if you have a non-Christian or a Christian, if the spirit doesn't speak to them, they won't understand it. Yes. So the good news is, is that God can make all things possible. And that's why I'm standing up here today. Amen. Okay. So Tuesday's lesson, moving on, uh, right on time, man, can't believe it. Okay, so Tuesday's, did you have a comment real quick? Okay, yeah, if we're, it was on what we were talking about, you can go ahead. I'll let you know and I'll shut you up. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Paul talks so much about conversion, mm -hmm. the new birth, um, being alive in Christ, 
himself being crucified. Mm. But again and again, he speaks to the Corinthians and the Galatians, and he says, put no confidence in the flesh. Yes. So somehow we think when we've been forgiven and justified and we've been given a victory, we've been forgiven, that somehow we're in a position now, in a place where we can do it, where we can we can be successful in mm -hmm. waging the war, that our efforts will take us to heaven. Amen. And so over and over and over again, God lets us fail so that we realize that we cannot save ourselves. Amen. God puts us in an advantaged place, not so that somehow through the flesh, our own striving and efforts, we can overcome, but that um, we will just finally totally submit to him and yeah, surrender yeah. to him. We surrender our, our own efforts to save ourselves. But, but what this has to do with this topic of the unpardonable sin is that Satan, every time we fail or fall short, are aware of our unchristlikeness and, and our deficiencies of character, will put our, put our case in the worst possible light to discourage us. Yeah. And, and also, I think we have to be very aware that we should not presume on God's mercy and love. You know, when I fell away that time, I literally had gotten myself into a position that when God called me back, I knew it was my last opportunity. Uh, you know, I've had people say, oh, no, I'm sure God would have. No, I knew. I, I had pressed the limit so close. I had hardened my heart so hard that that lasts. So we have to be very careful when we walk away from God or tell him no at any point in time. Um, I'm literally standing here by the grace of God. Okay, so somebody want to read Hebrews 10, 26 through 29? Rich. For if we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of a fire which will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much severe punishment do you think he will deserve who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has insulted the spirit of grace? So how does having no sin for sacrifice happen, according to this up here? I highlighted it in red as a clue. I know you guys are sharp. You can shout it out. It's just one word. Willfully. willfully. It happens willfully. So it happens willfully. So notice there's a progression here. Uh, this is a willful leaving. And the very essence of being a Christian is not my will, but thine be done. It's a dying to self. And at some point, it's a willful no, God, uh-uh. You've gone too far. I'm not going there with you. And I am going to do what I am going to do. And that's a scary place to be. Uh, it's having a disregard for the covenant as in Galatians 25, 32 through 34, where it says, Esau said, behold, I'm about to die. So then of what is use this birthright to me? And so he sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau uh, bread and lentil stew, and he ate and he drank, and he rose and he went on his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. He literally sold his whole covenant to God for something cheap and in the moment. And then insulting the spirit of God, which is Matthew 12, 31. Someone touched on that earlier. Wherefore, I say to you, any sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven you, but blasphemy against the Holy Spirit shall not be forgiven. And the reason why is because we harden our hearts to the point to where we can't hear the spirit. And if the spirit can't convict us, we can't come back. So notice the progression. My will over God's selling my birthright for something cheap and in the moment. Well, God, 
you know, just this one Sabbath, there's this sale, and you know my budget is tight, and if I just, you know, I'm just going to run to the store and buy it, because after all, it's, it, I'll use it for you. It's, it's, it's selling out God for something I want in the moment, which finally leads to committing the unpardonable sin. So the quarterly brings out the important point that the word insult means hubris, arrogance, conceit, vanity, and pride. Why is arrogance, conceit, and uh, why is it arrogance, conceit, and pride to trample God's covenant? That's right. It's the original sin, and Satan had it. I don't. I think I can run my own life, thank you very much, but out God, I can use you for all the times that I need to pray for money or pray for a relative or pray for help, but when it comes to doing something I want to do, just leave me alone, let me do it, and then I'll ask for forgiveness later. Um, so we think that we can still do what we want and have God accept us. So how, how serious is it? Pretty serious if it says it's hubris. Hubris is not a word you want to be connected to. Michael? Hi. I think also in all this process, it's little by little. Yes. And sometimes, you know, there's things in our life that we know we have to correct. Mm -hmm. But if we don't acknowledge them and correct them, we can little by little be drifting away Amen. from the Lord. And on this point about the pride and arrogance, yeah, just what's, what was stated earlier the need of feeling like I can do it all by myself. Mm. And I think that that really impacts a lot of men. Mm. I was, I'll share a quick example. I was talking to some of the students and there's a, a, a topic we cover talking about the like second grade awakening, first grade awakening. And they noticed that there's a lot of women in church more than men. If you track throughout history, there's been more women predominantly in the churches than men. So the question is, why is that? A lot of men, not only are they distracted with the cares of this life, I need to go make money, but also the pride. pride. I don't need to depend on anybody else. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you how many times I've heard people say, well, I don't need church to worship God. Hmm, except Paul says, forsake not the gathering of yourselves together. I don't know. Again, do we obey God or our own instincts? Okay, so Ellen White again hits the nail on the head. Maranatha, page 130. The great controversy between Christ and Satan that has been carried forward for nearly 6,000 years is soon to close, and the wicked one redoubles his efforts to defeat the work of Christ in man's behalf and to fasten souls in his snares, to hold people in darkness and in penance till the Savior's me mediation is ended and there is no longer a sacrifice for sin, is the object which he seeks to accomplish. When there is no special effort made to resist his power, when indifference prevails in the church and the world, Satan's not concerned, for he's no, no longer in danger of losing those to whom he's leading captive at his will. But when the attention is called to eternal things, the soul is inquiring, and the soul is inquiring, what must I do to be saved? He's on the ground, seeking to match his power against the power of Christ. And then this next phrase ought to terrify you guys. He is in attendance when men assemble for the worship of God. Through, though hidden from sight, he's working with all diligence to control the minds of the worshipers. We need to keep our words holy on Sabbath, keep our minds focused on Christ. He's extra active today, guys. He doesn't take the Sabbath off. He does not respect God. Okay, Wednesday's lesson, uh, better things. There's a silver lining to all this, okay? Somebody want to read Hebrews 6, 9 through 12? Martin, thank you. Uh, dear friends, even though we are uh, take it, talking this way, we really don't believe it applies to you. We are confident that you are meant for better things, things that comes with salvation. For God is not unjust. He will not forget how hard you have worked for him and how you have showed your love towards his name by caring for other believers, as you still do. Our great desire is that 
you will keep on loving others as long as life lasts in order to ensure your salvation. They will not become spiritually dull and indifferent. Instead, you will follow the examples of those who are going to inherit God's promise because of their faith and endurance. Okay, so what are the things that people in this passage above have done, uh, uh, have done that assures their salvation? They've worked for him. Other Caring for other believers. And there's one more. Loving others. And loving others. Loving others. So how do we become spiritually dull and sluggish or indifferent then? By doing the opposite. By doing the opposite. So how do these things ensure our salvation? Keep on loving. Keep on loving. Do you know that when you get over yourself and you do stuff for others, there's no room in our brains. Our brains, you know, they always talk about multitasking. Science has proved that's, a, that's fake news. We can't multitask. And everything we try to do that doubles down on multitasking, each task gets, gets robbed of it. So if you're doing two, each one's done at 50% capacity. You can do three and so on and so on. And it just keeps dividing down to where pretty soon you're doing nothing well at all. So we can't multitask. And so... It's interesting that if we're really sad and we're really depressed and we're having a really bad day and we go out and we do something for somebody else and we say, you know, I just don't feel like it. I just, I'm, I'm, I just feel so terrible. I don't feel like doing something for somebody else. But you do it anyway. Guess what? There's no room in our brains to feel bad for yourself and to feel bad for somebody else. And when your focus is on somebody else, guess what, guess what happens to your depression? It's gone. So it's almost like God knew something. Okay, wrapping things up with Thursday's lesson, Jesus as anchor of our soul. Somebody want to uh, finish this up with Hebrews 6, 17 through 20? Thank you, Amber. Hebrews 6, 17 through 20. In the same way, God, desiring even more to show to the heirs of the promise the unchangeableness of his purpose, interposed with an oath, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have taken refuge would have strong encouragement to take hold of the hope set before us. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul a hope both sure and steadfast, and one which enters within the veil mm -hmm. where Jesus has entered as a forerunner for us, having become a high priest forever. Amen. So what are the two unchangeable things? How did God guarantee his promise to us? What are the two unchangeable things here? Remember, I give you guys hints. It's in red. <laughs> He interposed with an oath, right? God can't lie, so we have an oath. And then what else? Yes, his covenant. He became a high priest forever. That can't change. He's a mediator for us. He's up there mediating. That cannot change. So in Paul's letter to the Philippians, he says, For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. Can we be perfect? Now, before you say no, remember, Paul just said, Jesus will what? Perfect. perfect it. So when you say no, we can't be perfect, you're calling Paul and God a liar because guess who's the one doing the perfecting? Is it us? Are we striving and working harder and harder and pretty soon I'm pretty good? No. No. Jesus is doing it, and he has promised with an oath, he will perfect it. And remember, I always say my mantra, perfection is not a level of attainment. It's not doing, doing, getting, doing more better things. It's not a level of attainment. It's a level of submission. Can you be submitted in any moment to God? Can you say not my will but thine be done in any moment? 
guess what? In that moment, you're perfect. That's what it is. And then we're closing with this. The warfare against self is the greatest battle that was ever fought. The yielding of self, surrendering all to the will of God, requires a struggle, but the soul must submit to God before it can be renewed in holiness. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much again for being the anchor of our soul, and more importantly, help us get out of our own way and to submit to you in all things. Lord, we thank you that you are the author and finisher of our faith and that you will perfect us until the coming of Jesus Christ. And we ask you now to go with us the rest of this day and bless the rest of our afternoon with you in Jesus' name. Amen.